When you think of important episodes of Star Trek, you tend to think of the best of both worlds, you think of In the Pale Moonlight, and of course you think of These Are the Voyages. Now, while you're gnashing your teeth and thinking, what's the fastest way we can destroy Sean? Let's just have a think for a second about the other episodes, ones that might seem a little bit forgettable, ones that might be like, oh yeah, that one happened. But there are those episodes that can fall into the latter category that actually really do deserve a bit more of a look. And with that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are 10 standalone Star Trek episodes more important than you realise. Number 10, Mud's Women. Mud's Women is the sixth episode of the original series, though it had in fact been considered as the pilot while Roddenberry was putting the series pitch together. It introduces the character of Harcourt Fenton Mud, who would return again in both the original and animated series, with Rain Wilson taking over the character from Roger C. Carmel for the Star Trek Discovery and the Short Treks. The episode revolves around intergalactic pimp and criminal Mud, rescued from his failing ship by the Enterprise. Three women, Eve, Magda and Ruth, accompany him. It transpires that they are to be sold to miners on Rigel 12 as wives. The episode is best remembered for the introduction of Mud, though behind the scenes it was one of the more innovative episodes of the first season. The planetary backgrounds were updated and altered from their appearances in the cage and where no man has gone before, so that audiences wouldn't simply expect the same backdrop every week. It was also a crucial episode when it came to lighting and colouring. The show was broadcast on NBC in colour, so the production crew put more time and effort into showing off the various hues they could. The end result was a show about the performance that is inherent with beauty, both in the script and the production. The plot may have aged quite badly, though, to be fair, it was questioned at the time as well. However, it must be said that Mud's Women became one of the more important early episodes of Star Trek overall. Number 9. Wolf in the Fold Wolf in the Fold is a strange episode of the original series. There are many elements to it that have aged extremely poorly, though arguably that was the point. Perhaps the most questionable inclusion of all is the assertion that having suffered an accident caused by a female crew member, Scotty might develop a hatred towards all women. This, no word of a lie, is Dr. McCoy's medical opinion. So he is brought to an exotic dancing club, murder soon follows. Written by Robert Block, the episode is an example of the author's obsession with Jack the Ripper. While Red Jack is revealed to be the killer in the show, featuring a guest appearance from John Fielder, better known as the voice of Piglet from Winnie the Pooh, it is in fact a retelling of Block's earlier short story, Your truly Jack the Ripper. It's easily one of the darkest episodes of the original series. While our earlier list, 10 scariest Star Trek episodes, didn't feature it, a reappraisal would place it near the top. It is also the franchise's first experiment with a true horror format, which it proved it could handle mostly well. The issue with the episode, one that pushes it out of most best of lists, is that it's frankly bizarre assertions of McCoy. While there are parts of the episode that fall under entirely forgettable territory, the main thrust is one of the finest examples of a truly scary episode in Star Trek. Number 8. The Naked Now the Naked Now is a straight-up remake of the original series episode The Naked Time. This drew ire from George Takei, who described the episode as children wearing their parents' clothes. And to be fair, he really did have a point for this episode specifically. However, the episode, while generally a forgettable comedy, became a watershed moment for the character of Data. While it will frustrate some that Tasha Yar was simply a plot device in this episode for the android, later episodes give this moment between them a little more depth than was originally intended. The sexual encounter is referred to in the trial to decide Data's humanity. In that case, it was proof that, though technically without emotion, Data had the capacity to grow attached to others, something crucial in the argument of his being. Star Trek First Contact would later reference this episode when the Borg Queen asks Data how long it had been since he had demonstrated the fact that he was fully functional and programmed in multiple techniques. It may not be quite the legacy that fans had hoped for for Tasha Yar, but at least they were gifted yesterday's Enterprise two seasons later. Number 7. Symbiosis. This will hardly be a shocking statement. Symbiosis is a bad episode of Star Trek. While there are bits to enjoy, they're thin on the ground. So why is this episode important? That's because of the cast. First of all, it saw the reunion of two actors who had appeared in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, though Merritt Buttrick and Judson Scott had not shared any scenes in that film. Scott had played Joachim, Khan's right-hand man. Buttrick, of course, played David Marcus. This would sadly be the last time he would appear in Star Trek, bar his image being used in the Undiscovered Country, as Buttrick would soon pass away from AIDS-related complications. The episode also 
contains the final filmed scenes by Denise Crosby as a regular. Skin of Evil had been recorded before this episode, though it would air afterward. Look closely. As Picard and Crusher are leaving the cargo bay for the last time, Crosby waves energetically in the background. This, in her words, was a wave of goodbye to the fans. This led to a rather sharp exchange on Twitter between Rick Berman and Denise Crosby. Berman once tweeted the image of a com badge that he had claimed was given to him by Crosby on her last day of filming Skin of Evil. She quickly shot back that this couldn't be true, not simply because Symbiosis was her last episode, but also because, she alleged, Berman had walked to her, torn the badge away, and said she wouldn't need it anymore. Ouch. Number 6. Sanctuary. Sanctuary is a second season episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. It's by no means a bad episode, though it again could easily fall into the curse of early episode syndrome. While DS9 actually survived that curse with arguably the fewest entries, this was not one of them. The Screens arrive from the Gamma Quadrant, displaced from their homes. Though this would not be the first mention of the Dominion in DS9, they had been already mentioned in Rules of Acquisition, this was perhaps the first example of how bad they could get. Three million desperate survivors fleeing the Gem Hadar, though they of course weren't named Named until the end of the season, set the stage for much of the bloodshed to follow. Andrew Koenig guest stars as Tumac, a troubled screen teenager. While his people are negotiating with the Bajorans for a place to settle, he steals a ship and attempts to land on Bajor anyway. There is a radiation leak that is ignited by phaser fire and his ship explodes. Koenig was the son of Walter Koenig, who of course played Chekhov in the original series. Andrew was a passionate civil rights activist and was once arrested for protesting in front of the Chinese float during the 2008 Beijing Olympics. He would apparently die by suicide in 2010, making Sanctuary his only Trek appearance. Number 5. The Muse The Muse is often maligned when discussing Deep Space Nine's fourth season, which is generally one of its strongest. Because Luoxana and Jake, two Marmite characters, are the lead in that story, it tends to get a little bit of grief. However, it does have the honour of having Majel Barrett's last on-screen appearance in Star Trek. She had in fact pitched the original idea to producers, who went on to write a plot concerning four couples. They then felt that it didn't work, so it was narrowed down to two, Luoxana and Odo, and Jake and Onaya. The story sees Loxana pregnant with a son. Now, while that son would never again be discussed in Star Trek, despite being the half-brother of Tiana Troy, the episode allows for beautiful scenes between René Aubergenois and Barrett, who had genuine chemistry together. Original series actor Michael and Sarah, better known to most as Kang, appears as JL. Jake's plot is probably the bigger letdown, although his experience with Onaya ties the episode directly back to the visitor. He finally writes his novel, Anselm, which had been shown published in the earlier story. Number four, Unexpected. Unexpected was originally intended to be a light entry in Enterprise's first season, giving Connor Trenier a chance to stretch his acting chops and introduce some new aliens into the mix. While both were achieved, the episode itself could, and arguably should have, simply melted into the background of the season, and then the Klingons appeared. In the episode, Enterprise must engage with a Klingon battlecruiser. The CGI model for the Katinga class, a battlecruiser that was introduced in the motion picture, was chosen for use by the producers. An entirely new design of vessel, the D4 class, was created by John Eves. He based it on the D7 original series cruiser with fewer windows than modern audiences were accustomed to seeing. Rob Bonchoon of Foundation Imaging then went on to work on it, but couldn't devote enough time, so Koji Koromura spent 36 hours of his own time bringing it to life. The windows were the issue. The producers didn't want a ship that didn't have noticeable windows. The designers were furious. Added to this, the inclusion of the future ship created a noticeable plot hole in a very early episode of Enterprise. For that reason, the very ho-hum Trip Gets Pregnant episode has become a show that abandoned a new new design for a cheap reuse of an old one. At least it became a cautionary tale. Number 3. Damage. Damage is the episode that follows Azati Prime, one of the most action-packed entries in Enterprise's third season. While the story itself isn't a bad one, it suffers a little from its placement in the season. This leads, despite some drastic actions by Archer and a strong guest turn from Casey Biggs, to an episode that pales when compared to the rest of season 3. There it could have remained until Star Trek Strange New Worlds came along. The alien race, the Illyrians, are introduced in Damage. In Strange New Worlds, the episode Ghosts of Illyria reveals that Una Chin Riley is, and has always been, been Illyrian. While the two depictions differ somewhat, it is explained in Strange New Worlds that the Illyrians began to experiment with augmentation. This would lead to a ban on joining Starfleet, something that Una risks by revealing her status to Captain Pike. The remainder of this earlier episode gives a little more weight to this first appearance. It also suggests that, despite Archer's actions in stealing their power coils and abandoning them in the Expanse, relations may one day thaw between the two races again, until of course Una is arrested in the final episode of Strange New Worlds' first season. Number two. 
Nothing Human. Nothing Human is a fifth season entry for Star Trek Voyager. The MacGuffin of the piece sees an alien latch itself to Torres, feeding from her to stay alive. The only way to carve it free is to use the skills and knowledge of Krell Mosset, a Cardassian physician in the ship's databanks. The problem is that Mosset is Star Trek's answer to Joseph Mengele. The episode delivers a fine ethical debate on whether the ends justify the means, but it's actually something far more than that. It's the final writing credit for Jerry Taylor, who had been the showrunner on Voyager for the first four years. Taylor joined Star Trek during The Next Generation and would go on to co-create Voyager with Michael Piller and Rick Berman. Under her tenure, the female characters began to come out of the background a lot more. One such example is giving Crusher command of the Enterprise in the episode Descent. While she would remain a creative consultant on Voyager for the remainder of its run, this was effectively her swan song. Her contributions to Star Trek would pave the way for future female showrunners in the franchise, such as Heather Caden and Michelle Paradise. Number one, Meridian. Meridian is a third season entry for Deep Space Nine and is, in a word, dull. It's not that it's particularly badly written, it just simply doesn't have an interesting A plot. The Defiant discovers a planet that shifts into another dimension for 50 years, emerging long enough to let Dax fall in love with one of its inhabitants. She chooses to go with them, it doesn't work, not the point of this entry. It's the episode that gives the great gift of Jeffrey Combs to Star Trek. This was his first appearance, long before donning the lobes of Brunt or the snark of Wayoon. Here, he appears as Tyron, a merchant looking for a very specific hollow suite program from Quark. Combs' contribution to Star Trek is hard to truly sum up. He was one of the best villains in Wayoon, one of the greatest love-to-hate characters in Brunt. His turn as Shran gave him a somewhat swashbuckling hero type, whereas his portrayal of an evil AI in Lower Decks is just perfect. He's one of the few actors to appear as many times as he has, with as many different characters as he has. The fandom waits with bated breath for his return to live action, and to think it was this forgettable little episode that gave us one of the greatest gifts of all. And that's everything for our list today, folks. Now, while I have you, we are aiming to hit 250,000 subscribers by Christmas of this year, so if you could help us out, you hit that like button and you hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to share this video as well, because it's through doing that that you help this channel grow. Don't forget that you can catch us over on Twitter, at Trek Culture. You can catch myself on all the various socials, at Sean Ferrick. Whatever you're doing in the world this week, make sure you make it a good one. Make sure you live long and prosper. And to my friends in Ukraine, stay safe, stay strong. Much love, everyone. Thanks very much.